So thank you very much for being here with your films. Um, I'm going to start with you, Ray. If you want to introduce yourself, your film, and just talk a little bit, if you will, about the genesis of the story, please. Um, uh, my name is Ray Green. Uh, I did the film Stop. It was part of a third year class at NYU, Tisch Graduate Film School. Uh, I'm still a, a still student there. And uh, Todd Salantz was one of my teachers, and we workshopped the script pretty much for the semester. Um, what the does that mean? Can you explain for the audience what workshopping a script means? So we're, you know, he, uh, the assignment was to, to come up with a five minute film, essentially, um, that we can make for no money. <laughs> um, and he really encouraged us to really uh, to do that, um, and so I came up with this idea that you know someone would get stopped on their way home, and it was supposed to be a voiceover over the whole thing. And then Todd, my teacher, was like, eh, "I don't know about that, but you know I like the idea, like create a beginning, middle, and end." And so that's kind of how we workshop the script. So my original idea was transformed uh, through the class um, and workshopping it with the class. Um, and then what you see is the result of a two-night shoot in Red Hook, Brooklyn for the cost of uh, one lens, essentially is what we rented for about 500 bucks. And uh, who you see in the film are my friends. Uh, they're both uh, New York City police officers. Uh, they literally are police officers. The two police officers who play police officers? Yeah, yeah they are police officers. Uh, and they're also aspiring actors, so it, it worked out well for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, the main actor had never acted before. Another teacher of mine, Spike Lee, uh, I went to it, just got some office hours with him and asked him if he knew any athletes. And uh, he, he uh, because the guy was supposed to be a baseball player. Um, and he said, oh, he wrote down this number on, the, on a piece of pad, and that was it. And, and so I called him, it was somebody that worked for him, his, mo his mother, it was, the, it was the mother of Keyshawn. And uh, I asked him, can he play baseball? And he said, no. So. <laughs> But I really didn't want him to be a basketball player for, for a number of reasons, um, stereotypical reasons. But um, so yeah, that's kind of the genesis of the film. I started really thinking about uh, the idea after the Trayvon Martin decision uh, to acquit George, you know, George Zimmerman. Um, it, that one seemed to really resonate with me, and I just really started thinking about it um, after that. After that. And can you talk about how you, in terms of the script versus the tension that's created on screen? I'm assuming the tension was in the script as well, but how did it change and what did you have to do to really, what did you make changes when you were shooting or in the editing to really create that sense of tension and fear? Uh, I worked very closely with my DP um, and that helped a lot in shaping the actual scene, but the tension I think really comes from that it's not a super aggressive scene. Uh, I think the less, like, the less aggressive they are, the more aggressive the scene feels. So I think the hardest part was really telling, my, telling the cops to kind of sort of calm down, bring it down. Every time that they would raise their voice, it, it felt less scary for me. Um, so I think it was really just about being calm, just the regular stop, and, and, and I think that sort of adds to the tension. Uh, when somebody's being really nice to you, it feels awkward and weird, especially at night, <laughs> um, you know, when you feel like you should leave stop. So I think that was, uh, that's how the tension kind of came out on screen. Okay, we'll come back. I wanted to move now to Dan and to Jess. If you could each uh, introduce yourself uh, from, from Australia with Love and tell what you did on the film and tell us about how you came to find Bodhi. All right, uh, my name's Dan Gibb. I'm the director, uh, editor, producer, colorist, and partial composer of the film. Um, basically, uh, I've known Bodhi. Caterer? What's that? Caterer. <laughs> Caterer, yeah, sure, all that. Actually, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she did. Um, I've known Bodhi for quite some time. Um, we met in a church group when we were kids. And uh, over the years, he's been traveling the world, uh, very nomadic, and, and just doing this amazing art. Um, from found objects and using the word love. Uh, I had known him as a graffiti writer uh, in Denver and he um, was pretty well known there on that scene, in, in the graffiti scene. And then he switched from that and started doing this work with found objects and nature. And I found it really compelling. And um, I work primarily as an editor uh, in television and I wanted to take a step into directing and cinematography. So. 
I purchased some camera gear and I said, I'm gonna come out to Australia and we're gonna go explore and shoot, shoot some footage. Um, some of the places he shoots, I mean, the natural settings are, the, are beautiful and natural settings, but some of the urban settings, um, how were those to shoot? Um, uh, it was definitely interesting. Um, like the school that we did, there was definitely some fences we had to go under and some trespassing signs we had to pretend we didn't see. And <laughs> um, inside that school, he was building the piece out of the old ceiling tiles that he found. And after the fact, I didn't even think about it, but it was like asbestos city. And I didn't even cover my face or anything. So there was definitely some interesting, interesting elements as far as that goes. We did get into some kind of, you know, creep, uh, dangerous situations, I guess. And how long do his, I mean, he talks about the ephemeral nature of his work. Um, when he's painting inside those big, I don't know what those are. This side, I was going to say, when he, how long did that stay up for? Um, that rode for a little bit. I think that was up for like a month. And then uh, the building got demolished mm -hmm. after that. Those silos, I think, still say they were painted over, um, but long enough to be photographed and featured in a number of Melbourne street artist books. But he's done a few around Melbourne, and there's one that's long ways that still remains. And Jess, well, tell us about your role in the film and how you interacted with both. Well, just tell yeah, us about your role. Sure. No, I, I onboarded as a producer. Um, similar to Dan, I've known Bodhi a number of years. We've known each other about 15 years, and first five of those hated each other <laughs> until we started working at a restaurant together. And in that sort of pressure cooking environment, we realized that we could work together. And over that time, our relationship has developed and I've worked closely with him on a number of his art projects and just giving opinions and constant feedback and lots of late night Skype calls. And when this project happened with Dan and Bodhi, um, I was one of the first to get to see the footage. And it's as exciting as it is um, to see that we kind of realized there were a lot of things that we needed to work on, and without any background in film, I jumped in, and here we are. What were some of the things, tell us what you needed to film, like, when you saw the footage, what yeah. needed to be, what, we, what did you need to add? Well, a story. <laughs> a little bit, we had all of this footage that was, and Dan's cinematography is simply spectacular, and it was so much spectacular footage, but we didn't really, and Dan and Bodhi didn't really have a what or a why then, they spent two weeks filming, and, trying to narrow it down and create a story out of all of this sort of mismatched chaos and beauty became the biggest task that we had to work on. Um, I'd like to open it up to the audience for your questions, please. Balcony two. Yes, please. A question for stop. Can you talk about when he, if I understand the question, when he opened up his backpack and the two elements that are in the backpack, you want to know what they were? Oh, the, the question is what, 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 what does he find and take into the bathroom and flush down the toilet? Uh, it's, it's weed, uh, which actually in, in, in the state I think is okay, but <laughs> in, <laughs> in New York it's not. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's weed which he flushes down the toilet. Yeah, I, I think it, you know, it depends. It, it, to me, it's, the movie's not about the drugs, although that's something that is revealed at the end that he has. Um, whether he has it or not, it's a question of whether he should have been stopped. So I think that's, that's my, my point that I'm sort of making in showing you the drugs at the end, that whether it matters or not, if he has it, that's up to you. Other questions, please? Yes. Uh, yeah, all, all natural light. Can you talk about what the challenge is of like shooting on the street with available lighting and things like that? Um, and also just 
the story that you're telling, shooting it, it it's it, it, how you have to control an environment in an, in an environment that you really can't control. Uh, we were fortunate, like I mentioned, that the the two officers were actually officers, so that played in our favor that we could get some liberties to, to play around with. We were also a very small, very small crew, uh, maybe eight or nine folks there, which is very, in, in New York, it's limited size and scope. We had no, everything's handheld the entire movie, so we can get in and out very quickly. The, the scene that you see in front of the deli, we literally went in two minutes before and said, can we shoot here? And they said, sure. And that was fine. The, the baseball field was just open. We went on there. And then we ended up using the practical location. Keyshawn, the actor, uh, that's his mother in the film. That's his real mom, the same woman I called <laughs> to ask if. Then I said, wait, can I use your apartment as well? Uh, so it, it really worked out. We really didn't have a, a large budget. So we really just used everything to our advantage. And, and it sort of worked out that way. Um, shooting at night, shooting black people at night could be challenging. Uh, especially with no lights, uh, but it, it worked out. The DP used the sort of street lights in the back. We used an anamorphic lens, which kind of creates those flares, and it gives you a little bit of that. But the movie's supposed to play dark, so um, hopefully you guys could, could see enough to, to, to get the movie, so that's... And I think that the sort of the, the raw sensibility that the film has, really, like, it really plays into the care, it, like, the cinematography really plays into the development of the character as well. When you were directing your actor, I understand like having the police need to tone down, but what kind of direction did you give to your actor? Because he, you say he's, he's not an actor, but he really has a very strong presence. And I'm just wondering if that, how that was. Is that just his natural ability? There's gotta be some director there was definitely a natural innocence about his face. When I first saw him, I was like, okay, this kid looks great, can he do the role, that kind of thing. Um, I think the biggest challenge was that he found a lot of things funny, so, you know, we were stopping and he was just laughing the whole time. So it was just like, okay, what can I figure out that's important to him? He's like the MVP of his basketball team, so he's like a really good basketball player. And so he's I, a basketball player. In, or baseball in real life, in real he's, life a he's a basketball player. player. Okay. But I did not want him to be a basketball player in the movie. And so I was like, okay. And originally in the first scene, he's supposed to be playing baseball, but he literally cannot throw. Like worse than like just really bad. He cannot throw the baseball. So we cut that scene and we, we start the movie like as. He's finishing and we get a little exposition in the first scene uh, about him going on and aspiring to, to go to school on, on a baseball scholarship. But, um, but I yeah, think the, 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 the biggest thing was what was in telling him what was important to him and basketball. So just having him think about what would happen if you couldn't play basketball anymore. And just, you know, what would happen if I took away your basketball scholarship or if you can never play again. So just kind of getting him in that situation and just honestly exhausting him uh, to, we, we shot late, it was probably past his bedtime, so he was just tired and kind of didn't want to do it after a certain point and that was like the best performance when he was exhausted. We actually, at the noontime talk, talk back, we heard filmmakers talk about exhausting their subjects. It seems to be a technique that we're learning about this year. So, and for, for uh, does I mean, someone have a question that they'd like to ask, please? We'd love, where are you? Um, yes, please. It is. And like, can you tell me about kind of how that ended up working out from like how you may have gotten inspiration from editing the project and how it ended up translating into making the film that you were doing that day? Okay. Um, well, definitely, I, I knew that I wanted all the shots to have some sort of movement. Um, so there was, there was always some sort of pan or a slider move, or uh, if it was handheld, I always wanted to have some sort of movement in there. Um, just because I knew that it would need to have some sort of flow. And it was difficult because being, trying to be the director and the editor at the same time was, was really tough. And it was, um, it was a godsend because I, actually Jess brought on board uh, Daniel Young, who's a producer, um, was actually an Academy Award winning producer uh, and director. He's of, actually uh, been at this festival a lot and we had him here in the fall. Yeah, he, he came on board, he saw an early cut and he was able to give us a few rounds of notes, which was huge. Um, cause I was just going back and forth and versions and versions and versions and versions. And uh, he gave us the idea to put, um, to reveal all of the pieces that he was doing that say love at the end of the film. 
rather than after each scene when he was doing it. So that was, that was a big change for us. And everything he suggested we thought really worked well. That actually was a great reveal. It kind of, I mean, there is that sense of like the third act climax that was really what, like just seeing all those pieces at the end. I have to ask you about the koala and the kangaroos. <laughs> Did you find those in the field? Yeah, that was just out in the wild. Yeah, the koalas were just, you know, this far away from us. You heard the audience go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we didn't see any crocodiles or you know anything else, but definitely a lot of kangaroos and koalas. It was incredible. Um, a question for all three of you in terms of the working on your respect, the, your shorts here uh, that we s just are talking about. What was the biggest lesson, or gift, or insight that the process? You're, you're, you're filmmakers, and this is just a film and a trajectory. Um, hopefully a long trajectory. What was, what was something really special that you learned? It can be something like you'll never do it again, but I just, you know, something that you learned that was really, whether it was from a cast member or, you know, so, uh, love to hear. Sure, yeah, no, um, the whole process for me has been a learning experience because this is so new and it was funny, bringing Daniel Young on board, he's a yoga student of mine. And I happened to like send him a Facebook message and be like, I don't know if you know me, but you've taken my class for four years and would you mind sitting down and having coffee with me? Because I think I'm gonna make a movie. And he's so generous and he did. And one of the first things he asked was what I was going to be doing. And I said, well, you know, I've been working with Bodhi on his art for so long and I kind of view my role as like a project coordinator and you know, kind of putting all these elements in place. And he leaned forward and he goes, Jess, it's called a producer. <laughs> And I was like, no, and he's like, no, 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 if you're gonna make a movie, you're gonna have to start calling yourself a producer. And just that Daniel, this whole time, has been own it. Own what you're doing, you don't have to know, but really step into the role and it'll all come together. And from that point on, he's, that's been the biggest help for me. Uh, I'd say for me, it's just to not try to wear so many hats. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's uh, to just, farm stuff out. I mean, there's so many things I think, oh, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it, but you just end up spending so much time that it would be easier to just farm it out to somebody and, you know, put in your two cents, but let them, let them carry it, and, and then it becomes more of a uh, group project. Thank you. Uh, I think with this film, we're, we've been incredibly, incredibly fortunate that uh, we didn't have to spend a lot of money on the film, and I think there's a you know, at, at, in film school, sometimes people spend fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars to make short films, and and nobody sees them. And um, I think if you have a good story, um, and you have some friends and someone that knows how to how to operate the camera, that you can do a lot with a little. And I and I think we proved that with this film. I mean, it premiered at Sundance, and we sold it to Condé Nast, and now I'm here in Aspen, and, and it's amazing. So I think, um, yeah, I just think we've been incredibly fortunate, and. Um, yeah, keep your budgets low and, and uh, your story's high, I guess. An economy of means. Um, I'm gonna ask you one last question and then um, our filmmakers will be here for a while. Actually, you leave tomorrow, Ray, but both of, the, and I hope that you're gonna be on the panel tomorrow as well. I sent you an email. You can't be it? Okay, you can't do it. But tomorrow at our noontime talk back, Ray will be one of a couple of filmmakers that will be at the Red Onion so we can have more of a conversation. But tell us, I know you're going around with this short. What's your next project? If you have, can you talk about what you're working on? Uh, yes. You don't have to. <laughs> uh, I'm developing my first feature film. It'll be my thesis project at NYU. Uh, so I have a year to graduate, so I gotta write it and shoot it. But I, I am planning on making a feature. My brother's also a filmmaker. He made a film called Gun Hill Road, which you may have seen. Uh, and he's my inspiration for going into film. It was his thesis film at NYU, so now we have a little brother competition thing going on. So <laughs> I need to graduate with a, with a feature film that does just as well as his did, so. Okay, well, we're rooting for you. Thanks. <laughs> and Dan? Well, we've been, we've been talking about um, taking this idea and going nationwide with it, and doing, hitting all 50 states, and having Bodhi do a, a piece in each state that represents something significant about that state. So we're trying to work out the details of that right now. 
We look forward to that as well. Thank you all for being here with your films. We're thrilled to have you. And thank you for joining us. I hope to see you back at 8.30.